Hi, I'm Cynthia McDonald. I'm a trustee here at Victoria Mansion. And there are many aspects of the mansion that are my favorite. But one of them today, I will tell you about trompe l'oeil briefly. That is a French term that means fool the eye. And today I'm in the reception room where there's an exquisite example of this behind me. Um, and what it is, is the frame looks 3D, but it's really flat. Um, I'm going to introduce now our two of our guests who are going to give an overview of different aspects of tea. And their names are Marianne Russo of Nellie's Tea Company and Melinda Thomas of Clipper Merchant Tea House. So come with me to the dining room. Hi everyone, I'm Marianne Russo from Nellie's Tea Company and I'm delighted to have been invited here to the Victoria Mansion to talk about my favorite uh, topic which is tea. I'd like to share with you my enthusiasm about this amazing plant. Most of us don't think where our cup of tea comes from when we sip it, but in fact it is pretty um, pretty amazing um, to think about. So I want you to know that this is a tea plant. And so all types of tea, green tea, black tea, oolong tea, white tea, and something called yellow tea, come from these same leaves. The legend goes that tea was discovered by Shen Nung, who was an emperor about 5,000 years ago in China. And he was um, loved experimenting with plants and um, medicinal purposes. So the story goes that he was sitting under a tree one day with his pot of boiling water. And lo and behold, some leaves floated down into the pot. And when he went to drink it, discovered that he felt both this um, sense of stimulation, but also a sense of calming. And those of us who are tea drinkers know that, in fact, that is the effect that tea has on us. Caffeine gives us some stimulation, and something called L-theanine gives us a calming effect. So tea wasn't widely used until um, about 400 AD, and at that time it became used more medicinally in China. Tea began to be exported to Europe, first to the Dutch and then to England, and then uh, gradually spread around Europe. And of course we know that here in America the colonists fought a war due to a high taxation of tea by King George in England. When I thought about doing the talk here at this mansion, um, I tried to envision what, what tea would have been like in the world at the time that uh, people were inhabiting the Victoria Mansion here. By the time the Morses built this house in 1860, America was uh, importing tea directly from Asia, from China, from Japan, um, and didn't have to go through the British any longer. I did want you to know um, about the different types of tea. It's important to understand that these leaves all come from that plant, and it depends entirely on how the leaf is handled once it's been plucked. If it's allowed to oxidize a long time, it becomes black tea. If it oxidizes just a small amount, it becomes oolong tea. If it's not oxidized at all, it becomes green tea. And it's pretty fascinating the hundreds of flavors that come just from the tea leaf itself, not by adding any flavoring, any other uh, botanicals or any other ingredients. One thing that um, 
we Americans invented was the clipper ship, which helped to transport tea from Asia more quickly. Um, the clipper ship first came into being around 1845 to 1885. And we have here a depiction of a clipper ship and also the hull of the clipper ship. And that shows that in order to keep the ship stable, they often packed a lot of porcelain ware and tea in the bottom of the ship uh, to give it weight and to keep it from bobbing around. And so in that way, we Americans really used the Asian porcelain ware and um, the tea arrived in good shape. It kept dry there. It um, stayed fresher than um, it would otherwise. I also wanted to point out to you that these are examples of the sorts of crates that tea is shipped in. And, and even still, but even, even back in the early days, it was shipped in uh, big crates um, sometimes made of bamboo or other types of lightweight wood. And then they would be lined with metal to keep the tea fresh and to keep the tea from absorbing odors and dampness. Um, and so it would be in good condition. Some tea importers still use this type of box. These are, these are not terribly old. These are, are newer crates and they're made of like plywood. This small one it was probably had a, uh, some rare type of tea in it because it's such a small amount. It would be lined with a type of metal so that, um, so that it kept the tea fresh. I wanted to talk a little bit about the two families who lived here in the house. The first family who built the house was um, the Morse family, Ruggles Sylvester Morse and his wife Olive. And they were natives of Maine and uh, made their fortune in hotels um, after they moved to New Orleans where they had a very big and luxurious hotel. And they built the mansion as a summer home. And when they first um, started coming here in the summer, this was the most modern house um, in the area. So many of the features and fittings were taken from Mr. Morse's hotel designs. The Morse's, according to reading that I've done, enjoyed a very well-stocked wine cellar. Um, and so I'm not sure how much entertaining with tea they would have done, but I'm sure they did some. It was popular during the times that they lived here. They lived here from 1860 to 1893. And so they might have um, enjoyed tea either in the afternoon, Mrs. Morse might have had friends in, or another popular way to use tea during that time was as a mixer with alcohol. Um, during those days, there wasn't the, the variety of mixers that we have now. T cocktails were not as uh, popular, and so oftentimes what would get served would be a punch, and the base of that punch would be tea, and then alcohol and other ingredients uh, would be added. So the teas that they might have enjoyed would have been from China, also, by that time, we were importing tea from India, and tea had just begun to be grown in Sri Lanka, which was called Ceylon at that time. The Mr. Morris died in 1893, and the house was sold to uh, the Libby family, and they lived here until 1929. Mr. Libby was a dry goods merchant. At first he was a traveling salesman and then he had a, a dry goods store here in Portland. 
they had a very large family, so I'm sure this was a really busy household with lots of entertaining taking place. However, they were very strong prohibitionists. So we know that they would not have served uh, tea-based punch here. My guess is that they would have served a lot of tea and might have had tea parties. They might also have um, gone out to a couple of places that were beginning to serve tea in the area. Also during this period of time, um, iced tea came, became popular. Um, at one of the World's Fair, a tea, tea importer was serving tea and it was so hot that he decided to ice it because uh, so that people would enjoy it more. And that led to iced tea becoming more popular in America. And actually the uh, iced tea is the most enjoyed form of tea here in the U.S. still. Also during the period of time this house was inhabited, the tea bag became popular. In 1910, um, a tea vendor decided to give samples of tea in a little silken bag. And people who received them thought that they were meant to, to put that in their cup and drink it. And so from that time on, um, tea in a tea bag became more available. Also in the Portland area during the 1910s, um, two women, Mrs. Emma Watts and Mrs. Mary Sweat, who were residents of the Means House in the Stroudwater area of Portland, opened their home as the Stroudwater Tea House. They served afternoon tea, luncheons, and dinner by appointment. So uh, the residents here might have enjoyed having tea there in the afternoon. Another tea room that opened during the time that the Libby's resided here in the house was uh, the stores and tea room located at 586 Congress Street. And so that was just sort of the beginning of um, the popularity of tea rooms around America. During Prohibition here in, the, in America, we imported more tea from Japan than any other nation um, around the world. When the Libby's uh, moved into the house, and you'll recall that the Morrises had a well-stocked wine cellar, um, it's reported that the Libby's, because they were prohibitionists, poured out all the contents of every bottle that they found in the cellar here. So during the period of time, they might have enjoyed tea. Coffee was also popular, as was drinking chocolate. And so um, this period of time was when all of those beverages became popular here, here in America. I wanted to um, also point out just some pictures here of how tea does grow and the process of making it. So uh, as, as this gets focused in, you'll see tea fields in China on rolling hills. Then you'll see some fresh plucked tea leaves. Then you'll see tea leaves that is beginning to wither, which is the first part of the process in making tea. And then um, tea being heated in a wok, which uh, makes, makes oxidation stop. And then a handful of freshly made tea. One thing that's really exciting and interesting to me right now is that there is a, a trend of beginning to grow tea here in the United States. There are a number of uh, small farmers who, have, who are experimenting and some that have come along quite a ways in developing their own tea farms. Mostly they're in the south and along the northern west coast. Um, one really popular one, is, or one that is uh, making great strides is called the Mississippi Tea Company. There are also some out in um, Washington State and Oregon. 
some in Northern California. There's even one in Michigan, uh, which I understand uh, at that when the tea is grown undercover, uh, so their, their yield is pretty small. Tea grows really well in Hawaii, and so they're having a lot of success. The, one of the really um, outstanding things to me about tea is the that hard thing about growing tea the flavors are different it has to do with the cost of flavor. The terroir or the Asian grounds that they've grown in, is the elevation much of the tea process and still by hand, um, especially the, plucking. the weather in that and particular season. Of course, here in America. And so it's yeah, always changing. The cost of tea. Always different. And, and so each, there's area, a lot of the progress tea being made about um, has machines being developed to harvest the tea. To harvest the tea and that so American-grown tea, the early follow that machines tea would may not be the same when you could think of them as a tea or like China, trimmer. but yeah, it, it will have properties of its own that tea will, will have um, appealing. There are three actually teas machines that which that are U.S. grown teas. 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 One is a green tea, tea. one is a light one, and, and one is a darker one. If those one. become successful, and, and if they you'll be able to see that um, they compare pretty well with um, the price of it lower tea grown in Asian that countries. That could be a huge contribution. And the map on my board here is, um, shows tea, tea growing countries around the world. And so the tea originated in China and later was also discovered growing uh, natively right across the border in one area of India. So uh, it is endogenous to those two areas. The tea that is grown in other countries now have all been seeds that have been imported or cut cuttings that have been imported. I'd like to thank the Victoria Mansion for inviting me here today. I will accomplish exactly what I set out to do if I left you doing the following. Appreciating all that goes into making tea when you sip from your cup. I hope you'll be tempted to explore some new kinds of tea, maybe that you haven't tried before. And I'd love for you to appreciate the attempts of U.S. farmers to begin a tea growing um, uh, agriculture here in the U.S. and find ways to sample them and hopefully to support them. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed it. Good afternoon. I'm Melinda Thomas from Clipper Merchant Tea House. Let's talk today about tea tradition, how it evolved, and why it might be relevant to our times today. So originally when the Europeans went to China and they saw people drinking this beverage out of these cups, uh, this very aromatic beverage, they actually equated it with the opium market. So originally tea, especially by the Dutch, was regarded as evil, leading to dissipation, uh, laziness, and all kinds of adverse behavior. It wasn't until the early 1600s that the attitude shifted a little bit when they discovered more about the medicinal qualities of tea. And at that time, tea was regarded only as a medicine. And this is interesting because um, it was only sold in apothecaries at the chemist. And it's also where we get the very British expression, taking tea. Instead of drinking tea, the British often say taking tea, and that's because it was like taking medicine. So in the mid-1600s, the attitude towards tea shifted again when Catherine of Braganza came from Portugal to marry Charles II from England. And Catherine was a real trendsetter. Um, she had all the latest fashions, she had all the most cutting edge modern palace decor. Whatever Catherine did, that's what the other wealthy ladies wanted to do. So when Catherine brought to England this little case that had tea in it, and she began drinking tea, of course that's what all of the aristocrats wanted to do. And it's usually what happens when the wealthy find an activity they like, 
they like to make it very exclusive for themselves. They don't want the rabble, the masses, sharing it. So this is where we find the beginnings of not just the very expensive cost of tea. And to give a demonstration of that, um, I can show you tea almost costs the same as gold at that time. And you can imagine um, how, how much was involved in transporting it from China all the way to England and Holland. Um, this is a tea caddy, thanks to Marianne from Nellie's Tea. Um, and it, this is what the wealthy would often do. They would put their tea in a tea caddy. And um, the most important part of this was that it had a lock and key. They would lock it up so that the help would not pilfer it. The last thing they wanted was for a servant to get a hold of their tea. So beyond the cost, we also have now the development of some of the tea tradition and etiquette. Because, of course, one way to make things exclusive is to develop a lot of rules about it. So the wealthy Brits wanted to show that they had a lot of self-discipline and that this was something that they could do. So this is where you get some of the tea etiquette. Um, you know, don't ever let the spoon touch the side of the cup. Make sure the spoon is put on a saucer. Um, make sure that you're pouring from a beautiful six to eight inch angle. Don't ever let your back hit the back of the chair. Be sure to perch on the end of your chair. Keep your ankles crossed at all times. So you have this etiquette developing once again um, to differentiate themselves from the masses. And at the same time, if you want to show your wealth, you're going to want to show material items. So this is also when we get the start of the British manufacturing of teaware. And so it was likely that you would have a wealthy household having all kinds of teapots and tea tables and tea trays, all the accoutrements of tea. Uh, they might have trivets. Now, if this were a trivet in a British household, it might have the family crest on it or the royal emblem. And you also have the beginnings of the tea manufacturing industry in Stoke-on-Trent, which is in England. Um, which has historically and affectionately been called by the British the Potteries. Now, this is an example of the quintessential British teapot called the Brown Betty. Now, the Brown Betty has been made according to the same recipe for 300 years. It's produced in Stoke-on-Trent. It's been produced there for a long time. And it's considered the best engineered teapot in the world. It has a very round cavity here, and the purpose of that is because it allows the water to circulate, it allows the tea leaves to aerate so that they can release all of their flavor and um, their medicinal antioxidant qualities rather than be squeezed into a little tea ball. Um, this is a very large brown betty. It's terracotta. It has what's called a Rockingham glaze. The Rockingham glaze has not changed since 1680. And um, it's traditionally, this is a very dark brown, although it probably looks black. But you'll see a lot of experimentation now with brown betties. They're coming out with blue ones and albergine ones and different colors. It's the same glaze. And this one I like to show is uh, pretty heavy. And it has a little finger rest there so that when you're pouring, you can actually rest. And you don't have to put so much pressure on your wrist. Now, one of, um, one of our dear friends, one of the dear friends of Victoria Mansion, named Andrew, he grew up in Stoke-on-Trent, and he has a great story. Um, all of his relatives worked in the potteries, and so when he was a young lad, he was the one on Boxing Day, uh, which is a holiday we don't celebrate here, but is celebrated around Great Britain the day after Christmas, on Boxing Day. He had a brown Betty that was about 10 times this size, and he had to go around to every single neighbor and pour them a cup of tea, as per tradition. 
So um, he tells the story about how he had this huge brown Betty and he had to put it on wheels in order to be able to take it through the streets of Stoke-on-Trent. Okay. So the British worked really hard for a long time to um, figure out how to make porcelain. The Chinese were the porcelain makers and they kept their recipes very, very secret. They didn't want to share that information with anybody. So the British, being frustrated, went back to Britain and you know, kept trying. And they finally discovered that they could make porcelain using kaolin clay. And with kaolin clay, rather than gold, uh, the Chinese used liquid gold for their porcelain. But what kaolin clay enables the um, China maker to do is create all these beautiful little flourishes and details on the pot. Um, so you have the beginnings of really what we consider sort of the teapot manufacturing business in England. Um, I think most of us are familiar with this kind of teapot. It's the kind of teapot we most associate with British teas. Um, beautiful, you know, shape of the spell, beautiful detailing on the, the handle. And they took it a little bit further and they realized that you could add bone, crushed up bone, to the um, porcelain mixture. And you'd get a china that was a little bit stronger and even a little bit um, allowing for more delicacy and more detail. So this is a beautiful bone china teapot. And yes, they did really use bones. Um, they were crushed up animal bones, but we always hear stories about how the bone yards of London were raided, um, how there were thieves that would go in, paid by the potteries, to go into the bone yards and steal the bones of the poor so that they could be crushed up and put into bone china. So if you have any of these old teapots from Victorian times floating around your house, it very well may have human bones in it. So the other thing they did is they started experimenting with styles and, um, and by the 1920s they were coming up with all kinds of different teapot styles. This is a teapot from the 1930s. You can see it has a little bit of the modern influence a little bit of Art Nouveau, um, and it mimics an actual coffee pot. So while all this was going on in England, there was a parallel tradition going on in Japan. Now, Japan did not natively grow tea. Japan actually went to China and brought the tea back. It was Buddhist monks that brought tea back to Japan. And um, <clears throat> Again, just like the British, the Japanese wanted to keep it restricted, the drinking of tea to the upper classes. So it was pretty much only the high-level Buddhist monks and the shogun, the warrior, who were allowed to drink tea. And what we have in Japan is the um, creation of one of the most beautiful and intricate tea traditions of all time, the Japanese tea ceremony. Now the Japanese tea ceremony takes years and years and years to learn how to perform. Um, it's not only that there are prescribed gestures, there are particular actions, there's a whole methodology, but it also involves a certain mindset and a certain intention. So the people that actually perform tea ceremony have been studying for decades how to do this. And as you can imagine, it's also very pricey. If you go to Japan and you partake in a, a traditional Japanese tea ceremony, it will cost something because of the level of expertise. This is a traditional Japanese teapot called a tetsuban, and it's cast iron. Um, one of the advantages of these teapots is that it will hold the temperature consistently for a very long time, which makes it very good for green tea. Um, one of the disadvantages is that it's very heavy, it's cast iron, and it gets very hot, so you would definitely want to use um, some kind of a tea towel when you pour it. So back to China where it all started. The Chinese have always um, had access to tea. 
So there was no class distinction, there was no effort of wealthy Chinese to keep it all to themselves and restrict the you know, other Chinese from, from drinking it. China has always um, been very, very democratic about its tea. Of course, it's a big producer of tea. So in China, you have what's called a yixing. You have all different teapots in China, but this is one of my favorite, called a yixing teapot. It's made out of purple clay. Um, purple clay is only found in this one particular place in China, and it has a lot of wonderful qualities, um, especially that it has absolutely no influence on the taste of the tea. Why is it so little? Well, the Chinese did not um, treat tea as something that you had at 11 o'clock or 4 o'clock. The Chinese were drinking tea throughout the day. This was their beverage. So they didn't need as much of it. And also they were often drinking um, a stronger tea like pu'er, which is fermented. Um, so they didn't need that much of it. They were able to get all of the nutrition and also the flavor out of just a little bit. This is another wonderful tea tradition of China called the tea pet. And I love my little tea pet. The idea of the tea pet is that you have sort of a good luck mascot um, to accompany you when you're having your tea. So you would put your tea pet next to your teapot, and after you make your tea, your first pour goes over the tea pet. Or you can also use a pastry brush and brush the tea over the tea pet. But it's, it's kind of like having a companion. And the thing about yixing clay is that the more you use it, the more it develops this beautiful sheen. So you can go into a Chinese household, and if they have all of their yixing teaware set up and it's shiny, you know that that family um, is really, really using their teaware and drinking a lot of tea. So those are some of the rituals. Um, I find that right now, during this pandemic, that it might be very, very important for us to design our own tea rituals. Um, we're living through a time where there's a lot of unpredictability, a lot of uncertainty. A lot of us have been, um, have had to put aside our usual rituals. Time seems to be going quickly, and then it seems to be going slowly. So I find that having a tea ritual to kind of ground me during the day is really important. And, um, you know, this is something that maybe I borrowed from Britain because I think um, if, if, if we consider the importance of tea during World War I and World War II, um, that the soldiers just had to have their tea. If any of you have seen the film Dunkirk, you know the importance of the tea ritual for the soldiers that were at Dunkirk. And I think a lot of us have also seen the beautiful pictures um, from World War II of the women holding up the teacups to the soldiers as they were um, in the trucks being taken to the front lines. So it's something that I get a lot out of, and I, I can share a little bit about my own tea ritual. I generally start in the morning with my chimes my desk chimes. And that brings my focus to what I'm doing. And then I like to have a cup of matcha. Now matcha, matcha is a tea, it's a green tea that's a powder rather than a leaf. So all you have to do is add water. And there are a couple tools that you use with matcha. This is a whisk, actually called a chasan. And you would just put your powder in your cup and then pour the water and then stir this with this figure eight until it gets frothy. And just sometimes the act of stirring can kind of bring a little comfort to me. And you know, you can come up with your own ritual, you can um, put on some nice music, you know, but the important thing is that it's something that you can look forward to every day in this very unpredictable time. Um, and I know I just wanted to add that some people have asked, you know, about a cup like this. This is a traditional Asian cup. You um, can hold it like this. You can hold it like this. Very easy to handle. Why is this different from the teacup we're used to? 
This is an example of the Morse family's beautiful French porcelain. How did the teacup get a handle? Well, of course, when Europe started making these beautiful teapots, they wanted their teacups to look like their teapots. So they put a handle on it. But what happens when you can no longer use your hand to hold your teacup? You're forced to really hold it with your thumb and these two fingers. And it can feel really out of balance. That's when people started raising their little pinky. That's where we get the etiquette about, oh, pinky's up for your tea. Because the pinky adds a little bit of balance and makes it easier to hold. But don't do that. Don't ever lift your pinky. Because that is considered an American affectation now. So if, if you're in Britain, don't ever do that because they'll say there's an American, they're trying to copy us. So I want to thank you um, for, for spending this time with me. I want to thank Victoria Mansion, this beautiful, beautiful place, for inviting me to share some tradition with you. And I wish you all tea days ahead. Thank you.